Mm-hmm. Um, each one, you know, it's, I, I, know, I, can I can see the oxygen added is also proportional, mm-hmm. so I can see the, the ratio. Mm-hmm. But I don't know, is that all we need? That's all you need. You just need to show a fixed ratio of carbon to oxygen. Okay. And so it's always going to be, a, in terms of mass, I don't know what that ratio is, but in terms of um, atoms, we could see what it is because we know the, the composition of CO2 should be um, one carbon and in two oxygens. Yeah. And so carbon is 12, oxygen is 16 times 2 is 32. Altogether, it's going to be 44. So 12 out of 44 would be carbon, and 32 out of 44 would be oxygen. And so we're always going to get the same ratio in terms of mass. So when it says fixed composition, it means by by atom? No, by just element. And so elements you can express in terms of atoms or you can express in terms of grams. You know, so what is the fixed composition of this is what carbon to oxygen or carbon to carbon dioxide? This is pure carbon masses of carbon dioxide. So this is carbon to carbon dioxide. So carbon to carbon dioxide would be a 12 to 44 ratio. So is, is the first one, if you look at the first one, 362 to 1326. So 362 to 1326. So we're, we're looking for a fixed ratio. So what we could do here is we could just go, okay, 362 to 1326 is the same thing as what to 44. And so <coughs> x. And so we can see, is this a 12 to 44 ratio? And um, So 44, let's do 44, 44 times 362 divided by um, 1326 is 12.01. This is a 12 to 44 ratio. We don't have to do a 4 to 44, it's just, I'm just using that as an example. And then we go to the next one and do that, does it come out to 12 to 44 ratio? And so then carbon, what we'd say is this. We'd say that as a mass ratio, there are 12 uh, grams of carbon for every 44 grams of um, CO2. And so um, that ratio is fixed. So that's, it could be mass or it could be atoms or it could be moles, you know, it's just gotta be, have the same ratio, that's all. That that you need to show. And so probably the easiest one is for every gram of CO2, how many grams of carbon, or for every gram of carbon, how many grams of CO2. So does, does like every molecule, or you know, every um, element or atom, do they all have fixed compositions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, every substance does. Mixtures don't have fixed composition. Okay. And so for, for uh, water, it does. You know, water is going to be, well, we could do it in different ratios. So two hydrogens, well, I'll use 2.016 to get four six figs. And one oxygen is 16.00. So it's going to have about a 2 to 16 ratio in terms of mass. And so every water sample should have about 2 grams of H for every 16 grams of O. Altogether, this is going to be 18.02. So, so this is where I got the percentage. And so this is going to result in a fixed percentage of hydrogen. What is the fixed percentage of hydrogen? It's going to be 2.016 divided by 18.02 times 100%. And so the percent by mass hydrogen in water is always the same. 
and it's going to be um, 2.016 divided by 18.02, percent hydrogen, and the rest will be oxygen, so this is minus 100 for now. So in terms of atoms, it's H2O. In terms of mass, it's this is the ratio, 11.19 and um, O88.81. That's the mass ratio, and that's fixed. And so the atom ratio is fixed at H2O, and the mass ratio is fixed to about 11 to 89 ratio. Uh -huh. So like, for instance, um, I don't understand what you mean by, um, sorry, I've lost my swatch here, but chemical properties of one hydrogen and two hydrogen differ, true or false? I we don't call it one hydrogen, we call it hydrogen one, hydrogen one yeah. and hydrogen two. That question is related to this. Um, you know, chemical elements are defined by what? The number of protons. Not the number of neutrons, the number of protons. So if you have H1 versus H2, you know, they both have the same number of protons. They're both hydrogen. And so if you drank some H2O, okay, in other words, this, H2O, H2, <coughs> did it taste like water? You know, did it have the same chemical properties as water, or is it different? Does it have different chemical properties than water? You know, water, well, what is water anyway? Is water pure? In, in a sense, yes, it's pure. In another sense, it's heterogeneous. It's not purely homogeneous, right? What's heterogeneous about water? If I had a sample of pure water, yes, it's pure water. It's got no contaminants in there. But when you look at the pure water, are all the water molecules identical? No. no. And so should I call it impure water? There's some heavy water contaminating my water? You know, just give me the light water. I don't want any heavy water. But is that really what we drink? No, we just drink water. And when we think about water, well, <clears throat> water, you know, mixtures will have variable properties. So it depends on how you look at it, because we can look at these things differently depending on what they are. And so, in, in essence, pure water is a mixture. It's a mixture of you know, heavier water molecules and lighter mo water molecules. And density is going to change depending on that. But there's something called the percent natural abundance. The percent natural abundance is what we expect to find on so average in nature. You, when you say, uh, uh, does it taste the same? I mean, I could argue that not all water tastes the same. You know? No, I'm talking about pure water. Pure water. Distilled okay. water. Got it. Yeah, water, the taste of water is going to differ depending on what they put, what minerals they put in there, but uh, no minerals here. Okay. So if you bought distilled water here in Los Angeles and you bought distilled water in New York, would they taste the same? 
Yes. Yeah. And when you um, when you taste the water, can you tell the difference between H two and H one? Yeah. And so, the the short answer of that is um, they have the same chemical properties. Physically, they're a little bit different. One's heavier, the other's lighter. But that would be the crude. I mean, you could look at it in more detail. There'd be some other differences that you might argue that are chemical. But and essentially... also because they have the same number of proteins. Yeah. Okay. So for... Elemental sodium and uh, sodium ion, they wouldn't have the same chemical properties. They don't have the same chemical properties. They have the same number of protons, but there's something else that's different between the two. What is that? You know, chemistry is mostly what? Do chemists worry about gravity much? No. These two will have different gravitational forces. Do you know? Because gravitational forces depend on the mass. And so if something's twice as massive, it should have twice the gravitational pull. But chemists aren't really interested in gravity. They're mostly interested in electrical. electrical. And so anything that deals with positive protons and anything that deals with negative electrons is going to impact the chemical properties. If you change the num number of protons, it's going to totally change the chemical properties. So mm -hmm. nine protons is fluorine, but ten protons is helium. Totally different. And if you change the number of electrons, it's going to change the chemical properties as well. Because chemistry deals with electrical interactions. Protons and electrons are electrically charged. And the electrical um, interactions are stronger than gravitational or nuclear? No. no. Yes and no. They're stronger than gravitational, much stronger than gravitational, but much weaker than nuclear. nuclear. OK, other questions? Um, well, uh, my office hours are Monday through Wednesday, okay. but since I missed yesterday's office, I can stick around. You have questions? Are you recording this, way? Yes. <coughs> this is being recorded. Uh, where did we leave off last time? Were we looking at ions? We're, uh, yeah, looking at um, bromates. Uh, yeah, I want you to memorize some of them. Those. Did we do bromate, iodate, all those? We did the... We didn't get all of them. We did the pattern? Not the pattern yet. We didn't do the pattern. We were only doing the memorized ones. Um, and we didn't get ones like iodate. Did, you do, did I do borate? Yeah. Borate and silicate? Yes. The other thing I wanted to ask you when it comes to memorizing, I noticed on the practice exam there's um, common named ones, mm -hmm. like butanol and everything. Can we go over what? Butanol is not a common name. Okay. Yeah, the butanol is. Uh, common named ones would be like water. Oh, never mind. Um, or ammonia. Those would be common names. Those ones, you, the common name ones, you just memorize. Okay. So people have memorized water as H2O. So then how would you know what butanol is? No, we haven't gotten there yet. Hmm? We haven't gotten there yet. Oh, okay. I'm going to get there today. Yeah, if you're looking at the, I posted a test up there, but the test has more stuff on it than what I've covered so far. So let's uh, talk about borate. Um, formula for borate. 
VO3, 3 minus. This one we just memorized. And then um, the other one was silicate, which has a formula SiO4, 4 minus. And so those are all the eights that you should memorize it because the other eights we can just derive from uh, just patterns. We try to minimize memorization. So I wouldn't even bother writing flashcards for carbonate because carbonate's next after borate. And the formula for carbonate is CO3, 2 minus. After carbonate, um, nitrate comes next. And the formula for nitrate? NO3 minus. Okay, after nitrogen is oxygen, but there's no oxate. And then after oxygen is fluorine. So what is fluorate? FO3 minus. Do you see a pattern? Can you see a pattern there? If you can see a pattern, then you don't have to memorize the ones in green because you could figure it out. But the pattern actually extends. Um, below fluorine is chlorine, and chlorate is ClO3 minus. And uh, below chlorine is bromine, and bromate is. And then iodine forms iodate, which is iodine. three minus. And so we can save ourselves some memorization by memorizing borate and, and silicate, and then just deriving the rest. Uh huh. Is it borate part of the pattern? Then? Yeah, borate's part of the pattern, but we memorize borate so we know what charge to start on. You know, there's more patterns here. Boron is in what group? Roman numeral group three. Silicon is in group four <coughs> or fourteen. That's silicate. These are the eights. Okay, uh, there's going to be a slightly different pattern here. And so let's take a look at this internal pattern here. After silicon comes phosphorus. So if this is silicate, what is phosphate? After phosphorus comes sulfur. So what is sulfate? And then below sulfur is SE. Do you know what SE is? And selenate is? And then below selenium is tellurium, and tellurate is? Yeah. Below phosphorus is arsenic, and arsenic is? Arsenate is ASO4. Yes. So this can lower the amount of memorization that we have to do. You know, we just recognize this pattern. So those are the eights. If we know the eights, then um, we can further reduce the amount of memorization that we do. Because if we know the eights, then there's things called per eights. Do you know what per eights are? Yeah, extra oxygen. So if this is chlorate, then perchlorate is ClO4 minus. And then we have the ites. If this is chlorate, then chloride is ClO2 minus. And then we have the hypoites. And so hypochlorite would be CLO minus, good. And so we don't really have to memorize those. We can figure them out. The PERS and the hypos only occur for certain ones. 
not for all of them. And then even floor, this one's troublesome for flooring, but I'll leave it here. Now, fluorate. There's trouble with that particular <coughs> item, but just to keep the pattern whole, we might not observe fluorite, but um, we'll just put it in there. All right, then uh, that takes care of the major ones, the eights and the eights. And then, um, what other endings do we have? We have eight, eight, and eight. Yes. Most of the eights, there's no memorization. Like fluoride, we know it's going to be F with what charge? Minus oxide is O with what charge? Nitride is N three minus. And so, <laughs> most of these are monatomic. And the charge we just get off the periodic table, you know, monatomic, most of them. But some of them are polyatomic. These polyatomic ones we have to memorize because these ones we don't just get off the periodic table. And so what are the polyatomic ides? These ones we just have to hour memorize. So the polyatomics would be like um, oxalate. What is oxalate? Ion. Acetate. Hydroxide. Do you know what the formula for acetate is? C2H3O2 charge. Oxalate. Oh, these aren't ides. These are the eights. Sorry. What are the polyatomic ides? Hydroxide. What's the formula for hydroxide? OH minus. What else? How about cyanide? Do you know the formula and charge for cyanide? C. C is right. And CN minus cyanide. Peroxide is one actually. Peroxide is. O two two, two two minus hydrogen peroxide is H two O two, but peroxide ions O two two minus hydroxide cyanide peroxide. Any others? I'm sorry. Formaldehyde is not an ion. It's actually a, a, a compound, a neutral compound. I can probably tell you which one is.
carb carbide is what we call monatomic, and we can just get it off the periodic table. So it goes fluoride minus one, F minus one, oxide O two minus, nitride N three minus, carbide C, and the charge four minus. So this one, these ones we don't have to memorize as long as you know the pattern in the periodic table. Do you know the pattern in the periodic table? Have to refresh the memory? Okay. What about permanganates? That would be an eight, and we need to memorize that. The pattern is these ones are negative one. These ones are negative Two, negative, three, negative, four. That's basically the pattern. Um, going beyond negative four, like negative five is too many electrons to hold on to. It's very difficult. So we don't really see it beyond that. Instead, it would probably rather lose rather than gain. And so this one was called what? Selenate, SeO4, 2 minus. What is selenite? SeO3, charge? 2 minus. Charge doesn't change. What is selenide with a D? Selenide. SE2 minus. SE2 minus. It's monatomic. If it ends in I, it's monatomic unless it's one of these polyatomics, which we have to memorize. So selenide would just be SE, and the charge, well, it's in that group, so all those are minus 2. Are those the only three polyatomic ions? With the Ide ending. I can think of right now, so hydroxide, cyanide, peroxide. All right, so nomenclature should be kind of review. There really aren't that many um, additional things. You know, we could derive some more. Like these can form the um, the bi. Actually, let's go this way. If I ha I see the prefix bi, what does that mean? So, for example, bicarbonate. You know, do I have to mem? I don't even bother with a flash fire card for bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is what? Carbon. It's carbonate with the bi. What does the bi mean? Two. It's got hydrogen. So if this is carbonate, then bi means add an acid hydrogen to this. So we get HCO3. And this is positive. This is 2 minus. So minus two plus one gives us minus one. So this one I don't bother e writing flashcards for either because bi are easy to predict. So if this is bicarbonate, what is bisulfate? HSO4 minus. Do you see that? Or we can call this hydrogen carbonate. If this is hydrogen carbonate, what is hydrogen sulfate? I'm sorry? Oh, uh, it'd just be the same thing, HSO4 minus.
And then um, if we continue on this path here, is there something called bicarbonate? So for example, if I tried to add another H plus to bicarbonate, then I don't get an ion. I get H2CO3. H2CO3 is no longer an ion, it's an acid. And so this is an acid anion. For acids, we name it based on the anion name. And so if the anion ends in 8, which this carbonate, bicarbonate, so carbonate, then the acid is going to be ic acid. And so if this is carbonate, then this is carbonic acid. If the anion ends in ite, then it's going to be aus acid. And if the anion ends in ide, ide, we use a hydro prefix and the ic acid suffix. So if this is selenate, what is selenic acid? H2SEO4. Yeah. Selenic acid would be H2SEO4. What would be selenous acid? Selenous acid. Yeah. H2SEO3. What would be hydroselenic acid? H2SC. And so selenic acid was H2SEO4. Selenous acid was H2SEO3. And hydroselenic acid is H2SC. is when you have two. For example, for phosphate, we have a bunch of different ones. So if we look at phosphate, PO4, 3 minus, then we have one with one hydrogen and a two minus charge, another with two hydrogens and a one minus charge, and then if we have three hydrogens, it's no longer ion, it's an acid. So this is phosphate, this would be called phos Phosphoric acid. acid. So phosphate forms phosphoric acid. But this would be biphosphate, but this would also be biphosphate. So we have a conflict here. Which one is it? And so we don't choose one. We call this first one monohydrogen. Yeah, and the other one dihydrogen. But is it monohydrogen biphosphate? No, we don't use a bi. We just use monohydrogen phosphate. And the second one would be dihydrogen phosphate. Okay, that's what I mean by this, hydrogen, mm -hmm. in place of bi. Okay, another one that's very common that I don't bother memorizing is thio. <coughs> if I have the thio prefix, you know, like the bi prefix tells me, oh, I got to add an H plus. A thio prefix tells me, oh, I have to substitute. sulfur for oxygen. And so if I know sulfate, sulfate is SO4 2 minus. What is thiosulfate? Okay, so if I know sulfate is SO4 2 minus, then what I do is I remove one oxygen and replace it with the sulfur. So if I take out one oxygen and replace it with a sulfur, I end up with two sulfurs and three oxygens. 
and the charge doesn't change, it stays the same. Sulfur and oxygen are in the same family. And so for thiosulfate, I don't bother memorizing it. I know what thio means, and then I can just figure it out. Or you can memorize it. Thiosulfate's a common reducing agent. Um, in other words, it's electron, what we call electron rich. All right, what did I, um, I talk about? Did I, uh, well, anyway, when we name ionic compounds, we name the cation and the anion. That's it. So just review some of the nomenclature here. Here are some cations and anions. We talked about plus two, plus three plus one, plus two. We talked about variable charge. Variable charge, we use a Roman numeral. Fixed charge, we don't. This is a binary compound. Acids. The ions. Which ones of these would I memorize? I'd memorize acetate. I wouldn't memorize carbonate, I'd derive it. Hydrogen carbonate, bicarbonate, I wouldn't. Hypochlorite, I wouldn't. Chloride, I wouldn't. Chlorate, I wouldn't. Perchlorate, no. Chromate, yes. So I'd memorize acetate, chromate, dichromate, cyanide, hydroxide, nitrite, nitrate, no. Oxalate, yes. Permanganate, yes. Phosphate, no. Hydrogen phosphate, no. Dihydrogen phosphate, no. Sulfite, no. Hydrogen sulfite, no. Bisulfite, no. Sulfate, no. Hydrogen sulfate, no. Bisulfate, no. Thiosulfate, no. And so out of this long list, I'd only memorize a few of them because the rest I can derive based on patterns. Right? Versus memorizing all of them. If you memorize all of them, you just make flashcards for all of these, right? Or write them down over and over again. Acids, I don't memorize any of the acids. If I know the anion name, I can figure out the acid name. I had you memorize those acids because some people don't see the pattern. But if you don't see the pattern, you just got to memorize it. So this is just all, you know, hydrates and other stuff. We already dealt with one hydrate already. This is cobalt 2 chloride. Hexahydrate or six hydrate. But one thing that we're going to do new is we're going to learn about organic nomenclature. Organic compounds abound in nature. There are lots of them. The foods we eat are made up almost exclusively of organic compounds including not only energy producing fats and carbohydrates and muscle building proteins, but also trace compounds that impart color, odor, and flavor to these foods. Almost all fuels, whether used to power automobiles, trucks, trains, or airplanes are mixtures of organic compounds of a type called hydrocarbons. Most of the drugs produced by pharmaceutical companies are complex organic compounds. Those are common plastics. The multiplicity of organic compounds is so vast that organic chemistry exists as a distinctive field of chemistry. So most of these compounds uh, are based on, on carbon, and carbon has a very interesting way um, that it bonds. You know, it can form up to four bonds, and it doesn't mind bonding to itself. And so um, we, we can form a multitude of different structures with just so carbon. For like a ester. An ester? Yeah. Uh, the, that would be a class of organic compounds. They have different classes of organic compounds depending on the structure that they have. And so ester is one class of organic compound. It's a class of organic compound that you don't need to know. But 
Esters are very important in like the flavor of fruits. You know, like bananas. And the smell of bananas. Do you know what that is? That's an ester. Or the taste of strawberries. Esters. You know, they put esters in gum and they put esters in artificial flavors. Or, you know, that kind of stuff. And we look um, for this structure. You'll see this kind of structure in an ester. You know, this part of it can be different. So sometimes we, we do it like this. R, C, double bond, O, O, R, prime. Mm -hmm. Where R is going to be carbon and other stuff. It can't be a hydrogen, though. If it were hydrogen, it would be a different type of group. This is an ester. And so this kind of structural unit will have properties. You know, it's got a composition, it's got a structure, so it's going to have certain properties. And that's what gives it. But what we're going to look at are different. We're going to look at um, hydrocarbons, which are compounds of just carbon and hydrogen, alcohols, and carboxylic acids. So, when we do um, organic compounds, you know, carbon likes to link up with other carbon atoms. And what we end up with are chains of carbon atoms. And depending on how many carbon atoms there are in a chain, and these chains can grow especially long, like hundreds of mol um, atoms in a chain, then um, we can form a great variety of, of molecules here. And so the first thing we're going to learn is about the parent chain. We want to know what the parent chain is. The parent chain is the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms. If there's only one carbon atom, we give it the meth prefix. Two car Did I already talk about this? Two carbon atoms, we call it eth. Prop, bute, pent, hex, hep, oct, known, dec, for up to 10. And so first we, we memorize, you know, them. There are three types of, um, well, uh, there are more than three types of hydrocarbons. But the hydrocarbons that we're going to learn about um, mainly are the alkanes. There's also the alkenes and the alkynes. So here are some simple alkanes. One characteristic of an alkane is that um, there are no double bonds. And it's just carbon and hydrogen. And so if we have one carbon, then we need four hydrogens to complete the octet. If, if we do that, then we form methane as a tetrahedral structure like this. There are certain properties. This is nonpolar. You know, electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen is negligible. Pretty much carbon's at 2.4, hydrogen's at 2.1. Difference is 0.4, which is in the nonpolar region. And um, it's tetrahedral in structure, so even, even if there was a small dipole, they would cancel out three dimensions. And so methane's nonpolar. Methane and water don't mix, and so it's like oil and water. Methane's nonpolar, water is very polar. Ethane's also nonpolar. When we look at ethane, it has two carbons, fill in the rest with hydrogens to complete the octet, and we end up with this structure here. Propane has three carbons in the chain. This would be propane here. These are alkanes, and so the ending is ane. Ethane is now keen. And it, an alkene is going to have a double bond there. And so if we have a carbon-carbon double bond, we complete the octets. We only need two hydrogens. Here. 
on these end carbons, whereas over here we need three hydrogens on the end, two in the middle. And so this is two carbons, eth, and we call it ethene. There are other classifications to these hydrocarbons as well. This is called an aromatic hydrocarbon. Aromatic has alternating single double, single double, single double, single double. And that gives us certain properties. And so this would be an aromatic. Benzene is a um, very um, versatile solvent for nonpolar things. It was banned for a long time because benzene is a carcinogen. But they found it in odd places, like for example, Perrier water had benzene, I think, at one time contaminating it. So was, I think there was a big recall. Now it's pretty clean. So with alkenes are a single bond carbon carbon, and alkenes are carbon double bond. What's alkynes? Alkynes are triple bond. So the simplest alkyne is going to have two carbons, like this, two hydrogens. The parent name is eth, and it's an alkyne, so we call it ethyne. Ethyne has a common name, it's called acetylene, so that would be, that'd be it. Did we talk about oxidation states? Okay. All these are electron rich. You know, the carbons are electron rich. They have um, electrons. X. They're on the electron rich end of the spectrum. If we look at the spectrum for carbon, what are the, what are the what do the oxidation states range from for carbon? Plus four minus one. Yeah, from plus four. How did you figure out plus four? Do you see how we got plus four? Do you guys see it? There's a pattern in the periodic table. So, for example, fluorine is minus one. Why is fluorine minus one? It wants one electron. Why does it want an electron? Because it wants to have how many total electrons? If fluorine has nine electrons. If it gains one, it's going to have ten electrons like neon. Oxygen wants two, right? So if it gains two, it'll be like nitrogen wants three. So you like neon? Carbon wants four. So this is how we got the negative four. <clears throat> if carbon gains four extra electrons, then it'll be happy in the sense that it'll be like neon with Wait, ten electrons. I remember one time I asked you uh, about electron rich, electron poor. Mm -hmm. You're saying carbon is electron rich, but nitrogen is electron poor. No. No. Nitrogen the, would be electron rich. No. no. Are you talking about the element? Or are you talking about nitrogen in general? I do remember asking you, like, you know, if, for instance, NO3 minus if it was. Uh, no, you have to look at it individually. You have to know what the oxidation state is. You, you can't tell. If somebody said carbon's electron rich, well, what carbon are they talking about? Are they talking about carbon in methane? There are two ways to assign oxidation states. One way is by following the rules. If we follow the rules, which one gets assigned first, carbon or hydrogen? No. no. Hydrogen, and it gets to what charge?
plus one. And therefore carbon is well, it has to add up to zero. And so it's got to be minus four. Would you call this carbon rich or poor? Does it have a lot of electrons or few electrons? It has a lot. This is electron rich. At the opposite end of the extreme is CO2. If we burn methane, we can burn it all the way to CO2. In fact, this is why people complain about combusting natural gas. This is why I think this is why they want to ban natural gas cooking appliances, right? They want to switch to electric because they don't want any more CO2. Yeah, every new house that is built has... Right, so the LA has, has banned all natural gas appliances. Um, because they don't want people burning methane anymore. But we talked about that. Um, electricity comes from also... Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It depends on where the electricity comes from, right? A lot of the electricity comes from burning methane, so so it's kind of it's kind of funny because we don't have any more. Well, we won't have any more natural gas appliances, but all that electricity, most of the electricity, at least in California, comes from burning methane, so. But I think what they're thinking is long term. Longer term, maybe they can make electricity from things that don't burn methane. And how do you make electricity from things? Well, you have wind, you have turbines. The windmills will generate electricity. What else? Um, hydroelectric, the dams will generate electricity, make more dams. What else will generate electricity? Solar panels. Solar panels, so more solar electricity. Geothermal will generate electricity. So they're probably thinking about um, zero carbon approaches. Nuclear, nuclear is zero carbon, so that will generate electricity as well. So that's probably what they're thinking. But right now, it's like, and the, and, and the situation is, is this. Um, Each time you do this, like say if you're burning and you're heating, you know, how efficiently can you use the energy? And so if we're, if we're burning methane to generate heat versus burning a me methane to generate electricity, which then generates heat, then which, which process do you think is more efficient? Adding another step in there or, you know? And so there are a lot of questions that need to be answered, I think, before banning it, but that's my, just my opinion. But anyway, if we burn methane, we're going to generate CO2. CO2. And uh, that's what we call complete combustion. And so <clears throat> for this, which one do we assign first, carbon or oxygen? And it's going to get the charge of what? And then carbon gets plus four. So do you see the range here? Would you call carbon electron rich or electron poor? Well, it depends. Are you talking about carbon and methane, or are you talking about carbon and CO2? Because there's no way I can answer that without knowing where the carbon is. Because carbon can be electron rich or it can be electron poor, depending on where it is. Does that make sense? The element carbon can be either. If I'm talking about the element carbon, it can go either way. You know? So for example, yeah, carbon can be electron rich. I should be able to burn it. So you have charcoal, you should be able to burn it, right? But you could also go the other way. Well, carbon's electron poor, so maybe I can make some methane out of that. And so something like this carbon's in the middle. This carbon's poor, this carbon is rich. Right. 
so that's how we do it. Sometimes you could have electron rich and electron poor carbons in the exact same molecule. So in this case, this carbon is electron rich because in assigning oxidation states, we make the assumption that the bonds are 100% ionic. So winner takes all. Did I already talk about this? And so if there's a tug of war between carbon and hydrogen, who wins the tug of war? The more electronegative? Carbon. Carbon's 2.4, hydrogen's 2.1. Actually, it's close to a tie. But when we do oxidation states, we assume winner takes all. And in this case, winner takes all, carbon took all electrons. That's 2, 4, 6, 8. Carbon normally has four valence electrons, so if it has eight electrons, it has four extra electrons, which means it's minus four. All the hydrogens are plus one. Remind me what that force is again, They're like dipole or London forces? Electronegativity. Strictly electronegativity. Fluorine's the most electronegative. Yeah. It's not London or dipole or any, anything. It's just a tug of war. The more electronegative element wins. What if it's a tie? You know? If it's a tie, then you have to split it evenly. You know, there's going to be no winner, no loser. So over here, CO2. Carbon versus oxygen. Who's the winner? Oxygen. So it ends up with 2, 4, 6, 8. Oxygen normally has 6 valence electrons, so it's minus 2. This oxygen is the same, minus two. But how many electrons did carbon end up with? None. Normally it has four, so it lost all four, so that means it's plus four. Are there any more electrons for carbon to lose? No, so this is why it's maxed out, plus four. There are no more electrons for it to lose. So when we follow the rules, we, we get something called the average oxidation state. If I look at acetic acid, what are the oxidation states in acetic acid? So who goes first, hydrogen, carbon, or oxygen? No. Carbon? No. Hydrogen. You have to follow that set of rules, so you've got to remember it. Hydrogen's plus one. And then who's next? Oxygen at minus two. And that means carbon must be what to add up to zero? So um, the way we do that is you can break it down. If you, can, if you can't see it here, we have, um, oops, not two, sorry, HC2. We have one hydrogen and plus one. And then we have two carbons at x. We don't know what x is. And then we have three hydrogens at plus one. And then we have two oxygens at minus two. And this, all these atoms have to add up to zero. And so what are the carbons? So uh, we could do this. One plus two x plus 3 minus 4 is equal to 0. What is x? Zero. X is 0. And so um, carbon 0. Well, if carbon 0, that means it's right in the middle. It's neutral, right? Like Switzerland or something. Neutral. But is it really? No, it's not. Because the rules for oxidation state just tell us the average. What we want is a more detailed structural analysis. So if we were to look at acetic acid, acetic acid looks like this. One part of acetic acid looks like methane. In fact, it looks so much like methane, we call this methyl, methyl type, CH3. But this is bonded to this group here. In organic chemistry, we call this the carboxyl group. Like this. Now, if we do the winner take all here, this carbon versus hydrogen carbon wins. Now this is a tie because these are this is a homoatomic versus a heteroatomic bond. This being a tie, we have to split it down the middle. 
one electron for this carbon, one electron for that carbon. And so how many electrons does this carbon end up with? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It ends up with seven electrons. How many, car <coughs> how many does the carbon normally have, valence? Four. Four. So this carbon is actually minus three. Is that rich or poor? It's rich. That's rich. Then we go to this carbon. Okay, carbon versus carbon tie. Carbon versus oxygen, who wins? Carbon versus oxygen? And this carbon ends up with one electron. It's supposed to have four. How many did it lose? It lost three. So this carbon's plus three. So even in the same molecule, the two carbons don't have to be the same. One carbon in this is electron rich. The other carbon is electron poor. Did I talk about eating vinegar? Did I talk about that? Okay. Will, um, you know, methane is a problem. We can incinerate methane, right? You can burn it, like they're doing in, um, in Palestine, Ohio. They try to incinerate the vinyl chloride. So we can burn it. We don't want it. Because methane, you know, like, you know, what, the, what was that pipeline that um, the blew up? Pipeline that blew up? Nord Stream. Have you heard of the Nord Stream pipeline? You, you haven't heard of it? I think it's like in the North Sea. It's a supplies. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, Russia owns this pipeline and supplies Europe. It's blown up. There's a whole bunch of hypotheses going around it. Who blew it up? You know, some people are saying Russia blew it up. Other people are saying the U.S. blew it up. But if you think about it, all that methane was released into the air, atmosphere. What's worse? as a greenhouse gas. Methane or CO2? What's worse? CO2. Methane's actually worse. Methane is so bad that people were talking about um, eliminating all cows. Have you heard that? They wanted to eliminate cows because cows actually produce a lot of methane because of their digestive digestion. And so one proposal was to eliminate cows Another proposal is in, in as a source of energy. Yeah, capturing the methane somehow. Can you capture the methane? Capture. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but you know what chemists are working on? Chemists are trying to change the di their chemistry, digestion chemistry, to so that they produce less methane. And so uh, it's an interesting an interesting article came out in CNN News where they fed the cows some um, algae seaweed basically and they cut down the methane that was produced and so they're thinking about adding this uh, particular type of seaweed in all cow food in all cow diets so that they produce a lot less methane because methane is much worse greenhouse gas than than co2 i think i, I told you once they were doing like it's in the works where they're taking um the kind of like the dna of cows and Turning it into a meat. Oh, they that oh yeah, yeah, artificial meat. Yeah, artificial meat. Yeah, that's interesting. They're getting the, um, you know, meat is just, well, that was part of the organic. But meat are a bunch of um, what, amino acids put together, mm -hmm. and then you can just you can make your own synthetic meat. But you know, would you, would you want to eat synthetic meat? <laughs> Anyways, what does it look like? Like, does it look like? It, 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 looks, like it looks like, a, like meat. no, it doesn't. It looks like a like yeah, meat. I'm sure it tastes like meat because it's just <laughs> meat. It's just, but there's just something about eating a blob, yeah, amorphous blob of protein. <laughs> um, uh, but maybe we're already eating it. Who knows? You know, that, that type of stuff they probably don't want to advertise so much. You know, yeah. and so when you read, it's like meat byproducts and hot dogs. You know, what is meat byproduct? Um, uh, no, I don't want to. No, don't, 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 let's not bring that <laughs> up. Yeah, I don't want to watch that, actually. <laughs> it's like um, pe they say people who go to it's the horrifying. Farmer John factory, they come out as vegetarians. <laughs> seriously, like, you know, they do like tours of the factory, or yeah. used to, at least. Yeah. But I suppose if it tastes good, you know, people eat it. It's an ethical 
It's like, you know, those, um, I don't know if you, those like jack-in-the-box tacos or something. You know, I mean, like, you know, I like the taste of them, but I, I always wonder, what is it? You know? I think it's soy. Yeah. I read somewhere that it's soy. Soy, okay. Yeah. Well, I like soy. Well, anyway, um, so yeah, methane is a much worse uh, greenhouse gas, and it's because it's a more complex molecule. You know, the tetrahedral that we just saw up here leads to more vibrations versus CO2 is just a simple linear molecule and uh, we get yeah, different ways it vibrates. So there are more ways this vibrates here than this over here. And so this is much uh, more. And so uh, uh, in, you know, around Santa Barbara they have these eternal flames, you know, where they're just burning off. Rather than let, letting the methane go out into the atmosphere, they burn it. Have you seen those eternal flames? Like if you drive up, if you drive up the coast, you know you go past Ventura, and then there's this eternal flame there. You know? And I guess it's just not worth it to capture that little methane. But now methane prices have skyrocketed. I think natural gas, natural gas prices. I don't know if anybody's complaining, but you know a lot of people are complaining that the natural gas prices doubled and tripled, uh, doubled to tripled in, in December. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so the heating bill, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, my heating bill uh, almost tripled. But uh, anyway, um, so we burn that uh, to CO2. But what about CO2? Um, can we get rid of CO2 by incinerating? Is it possible to incinerate CO2? CO2, CO2 is another troublesome greenhouse gas. No, we're kind of stuck with it here. So they're looking at other ways of getting rid of CO2. You know, so the methane. So I was wondering, you know, if they um, ignited the, you know, the gas coming from that, that would have been just a huge flame on the ocean. It probably wouldn't have been good, of course, for the ocean, marine life around there. But it would have been quite a spectacle to see. But I was thinking th they might have ignited it because, you know, what would you rather have? Would you have a bunch of methane, or would you rather have some CO2? I'd rather have CO2 than methane. There. Okay, so oxidation states, this is how we use oxidation states. Yeah. Um, now, can you burn, let's say I ran out of methane, but I do have some acetic acid. Can you burn acetic acid? Will acetic acid burn? Or, you know, I, I, I ran out of acetic acid, but I do have some sodium acetate. Sodium acetate is... Well, could you burn sodium acetate? Would this burn? It's getting cold. Heating bill's getting kind of high. You know, I have some sodium acetate laying around doing nothing. Should I just burn it and make a little fire? Will that be possible? Or I have some sodium chloride. Do you think you can burn sodium chloride? No. no chloride's too hard to burn. But what about acetate? I don't think so. Acetate will burn because part of it is very rich. And even this part's very rich. This is minus three. And even this part can lose more because this part of the acetic acid is plus three, it could lose, if it's plus three, has it lost all it could lose? No, it could lose one more to go to plus four. So if we burn acetic acid, do you know what we form? We form CO2. So you could burn acetic, if we burn sodium acetate, we're gonna form CO2. And the sodium, we have to do something with the sodium, but the acetate itself will go to CO2. Uh -huh. Which reminds me, um, from the practice test, sodium acetate is moderately electron rich and combustible. So how can we... Um, is that a true or false question? What was the question? Read out. Sodium verbatim. acetate is moderately electron rich and combustible. What are the answers? True or false. True or false. True or false. True. true. You see... That, did you, well, the people who requested a past exam, so I posted a past exam there. But that type of question there is recall. Can you recall the information or can you figure it out, you know? 
And so, well, that's good timing there. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to explain it later when somebody asks me, if, is that true <laughs> or false? It's, it is true. true. Yeah. It's true, you can burn it. Whereas you can't burn CO2. We can burn methane. Oh, we could so the one that says carbon, carbon di monoxide, carbon dioxide, and what's CO3 again? Carbon trioxide? Carbonate. Or carbonate are all potential products of combustion. Oh, oh no, carbon trioxide. Yeah. That, yeah, that's related to this. That's using oxidation states again. So you could try to figure that one out. Why don't you try to figure that one out and ask me if you give up next time? next time. But I already gave you the answer on that, I think. Yeah, you said carbon <laughs> is not, one of them is not combustible. Yeah, so if we have carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide is a terrible poison. Can we incinerate that? Will you be able to incinerate carbon monoxide to get rid of this terrible poison? In other words, burn it. No. No? Yes. Or yes. <laughs> well, it depends. Um, we use oxidation states to tell us. Oxygen is? Two minutes. And carbon is? Two minutes. For oxidation states, we usually write the sign first and then the number. For ions, we usually write the number first and then the, the sign or the charge. And so in this case, where is it? Electron poor, electron rich? Electron poor, electron poor however, it hasn't hit rock bottom, right? In other words, it still has two more electrons it could lose. And therefore, um, in, other, in other words, oxidizers can take those two electrons. Oxidizers are good oxidizers being oxygen. So oxygen can come along and take two more electrons from carbon to form CO2. So carbon monoxide is combustible. In fact, that's how they get rid of carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a product of um, <coughs> some chemical reactions, and what they do with the carbon monoxide is they just burn it to CO2. And CO2 is a lot less hazardous. Okay. And so those were questions from the practice exam. All these here are electron rich. So one of the characteristics of hydrocarbons is they burn very easily. In fact, natural gas contains mostly methane and a little bit of ethane. And then we use propane for barbecues. Right? That burns quite nicely too. All electron rich. The most electron rich will be methane here. And so this is really an excellent fuel. It burns very nicely. Methane burns very clean. And so clean meaning it doesn't produce very much carbon monoxide if things are optimized. Unburned product. Uh huh. Real quick, what was the name for the alternating single double bonds and carbons? Okay, these carbon hydrocarbons here are called aliphatic, and these hydrocarbons like this are called aromatic. You'll, you'll recognize aromatic by alternating single doubles here. And they form flat structures like this. And so benzene is important, aromatic compound. With aromatic compounds have anything to do with the other? Like with smell? With aromatic? They have to do with like perfume, other? No. So it's just the name? Yeah. Um, yeah, non-aromatic compounds can give uh, a lot of smells, nice, pleasant smells as well. Some of them are, you know, but it, it's different. It's a different kind of definition. Aliphatic. Aliphatic. You don't need to know it. But aliphatic and aromatic compounds are just um, some additional characterization you get to it. Not only can we form um, straight chains of carbon atoms, we can also form branches that you can see here. Do you see this branch here going on? And there's a little branch here going off. 
And so we can have a multitude of branches, and therefore we can form a multitude of compounds. And this is why organic chemistry um, split off from general chemistry, because there are too many compounds. If you look at the periodic table, you know, the carbon-based, um, the number of carbon-based compounds um, dwarfs uh, the number of um, non-carbon-based compounds. And so if you look at carbon-based compounds, the number is huge and growing, like millions plus. But if you look at the number of nitrogen-based compounds, less than 100, you know, I mean nitrogen, not not affiliated with uh, with uh, organic, and so so when we look at this, um, we can name some of these. Let's just get some practice naming some of these branch ones. And when we, when we name it, we look for the uh, longest branch of carbon atoms. So here we have one, two, three, four. Here we have one, two. So is it the upper or the lower chain that's longer? Well, actually, that was a, kind of a trick question because the answer is neither the upper nor the lower because, you know, when we draw these, it doesn't really matter how we draw it. We don't really draw the structure accurately. But you know what the longest chain is? Here. Let's start here. One, two, three, then drop down. Four, five. And so it's not four, it's not two, it's five. And so if it's five, what do we call it? Pent. And then there, are there any double bonds? No. And so this is called pentane. The chain's called pentane. But what we have is we have this branch stuck on here. The branch is called a substituent. And um, this substituent's called a methyl. It looks like methane, except one hydrogen is missing. So this is called methyl pentane. But we have to choose a carbon atom that it's attached to. And so we count one, two, three from the end, or one, two, three from the end. And so either end, it's three. So we call this three methyl pentane. What would this be called? We look for the longest chain. What's the longest chain? How many carbons? Five. And so one, two, three, four, five is pentane. But we have a methyl group here. And that's on either carbon two from the end or carbon one, two, three, four from the end. So should this be two methyl pentane or four methyl pentane? Or either. It turns out we call this two methyl. We want to go with the lower number. So this is two methyl pentane. Two methyl pentane and three methyl pentane are what we call isomers. Isomers have the same number of carbons, same number of hydrogens, but different structure. Do you see that? And so this 2-methyl and 3-methyl are isomers. And therefore, this is why it's preferred to write the structural formula like this versus, or this versus the um, condensed formula. You know? like this, these are structural formulas here. A CH3 is a methyl. So we have um, two methyls attached to this carbon and a hydrogen. And then we have these, CH2s are called methylenes. CH3s are at the end of a chain, like here and here. CH2s are in the middle of a chain. If you look over here, there are two CH2s in the middle, a CH3 on the end, a CH3 on the end here, a CH3 on the end here. Since this carbon has two CH3s, we've got to lose one hydrogen, so this is a CH rather than a CH2 in the middle of the chain. And so over here we have three CH2s and then a CH3. Over here, we have this chain and it has a, a branch here and then extends the chain here. And so it's asking if these are isomers. So what we do is we count how many carbons we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Is that, did I do the right count? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight carbons, eight carbons. So, um, and then the hydrogens are the same, so those are isomers. Are we added? Oh, we got five minutes. So. Yeah, just okay, so let's take a look at uh, some of these. What is this called here? B. Three methyl. 
three methyl hexane. What's this one called? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, two methyl pentane. But it has not just one methyl, but two methyl groups. So this methyl's on carbon two, this methyl group is on carbon four. So we call this two comma four dimethyl pentane. Dimethyl for two, two methyls and two four for the carbons. Two comma four hyphen dimethyl pentane. What do we call this? Now, we pick the, ch the chain in the ring. How many carbons are in this ring? One, two, three, four, five. Since it's in a ring, we call it cyclo. This is cyclopentane, and we have two methyl groups attached to it. And so this one would be called one comma three dimethyl cyclopentane. Okay, um, here's a cyclobutane, but do you know what this group is called? This is not a methyl. And so we have cyclobutane with something attached to it. This something that's attached to it is like propane, right? And so we call it propyl. But propane can attach either on the end or in the middle. This is attaches in the middle. So we call this isopropyl versus propyl. If it attached on the end, we call it propyl cyclobutane. But this attaches in the middle of a propane chain. We call it isopropyl cyclobutane. Then this one is called, how many carbons? One, two, three, four, but But we don't call it butane because there's a double bond. Do you know what we call this? Butene. And but the double bond could be between carbons one and two or two and three. This is between two and three, so we call this two butene or butene. This one would be a methyl. Butene. So this would be 2 methyl but 2 ene. Now you don't have to know some of these more complicated ones. I'm just doing the complicated ones just so you get an idea of these. And then we have alcohols and we have carboxylic acids. And so we'll take a look at the alcohols and the carboxylic acids on Monday. So I'm not, I didn't quite, I needed to review. Chapter 4 is mainly stoichiometry. So it's just a review of stoichiometry and um, molarity and solution dilution. So it's mostly review stuff. So, uh -huh. what will the exam cover then? Chapters one through three. Chapters one through three, and then part of four. I don't think I'm going to do all of four. If I don't do all of four, then don't turn in homework for chapter four, one through three. Let me see how far we get on Monday. Well, on Monday, there's a. Uh, oh. Um, so do you want to Tuesday, no, no, let's see. I have to do a Tuesday. Well, I'll talk about it Monday, what we're going to cover on the test. Maybe I'll, I'm going to catch up a little bit on Monday.